Good evening, everyone. So I'm um, Professor Deborah Johnston, and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Framework here at London South Bank University. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Stephen Dance. Now, whenever I give a, a presentation to a large group of people, I do say, I, I have got a stammer, I will get stuck on words, it will be perfectly fine. So, the presentation of an inaugural lecture is an important milestone for, in an academic career. And the inaugural gives the opportunity to, to do three things. It gives the opportunity to um, present someone's career so far. It gives the opportunity to um, share that research ex uh, expertise with a, um, while, with, a, with a wider field. And it also gives a tantalising glimpse into future research plans. For the schools where the, um, where, the, where the professor is based, and in this case it's the School of Built Environment and Architecture, it also fills some really important purposes. First and foremost, to celebrate. To celebrate the achievement of our colleague. Secondly, to strengthen existing relationships, those, um, those uh, people far and near who come to um, join the inaugural, but also to create new conversations and new collaborations. And for the university, for the, for the university, the inaugural lecture is an important way that we show the public the importance of our research and our teaching. So we resumed our inaugural lectures last year after the COVID pandemic, and we have recorded a, um, the um, set of lectures which took place last year, and you can find them on our YouTube inaugural lecture playlist. Please go and look if you haven't done. You will find lectures on a broad range and a fascinating range of topics. So we're meeting again in person, and that feels very special. Um, while we don't have questions after the inaugural itself, in, in, our, in our reception, you do get the chance for that lively give and take of conversation that you can't get on, uh, on an online lecture. We do have the opportunity to actually indicate by being here our appreciation for our colleagues. And we also have the opportunity to be in this place in this space to give the important gravity to such an important milestone in an academic career. And I also have the opportunity to give that age-old introduction to any face-to-face -face event, so let's go through it. Please switch off the volume on your mobile phone. Keep in mind we are recording the event. The toilets are signposted right outside. And finally, we are not planning a fire alarm test. So if the alarm does go off, please make your way in an orderly fashion, either towards the back of the room or towards the front, following the fire exit signs. So that's our ritual introduction done. Now I wanted to begin my substantive introduction of Professor Stephen Marson Dance. Stephen Dance is a professor of acoustics and he studied computer science at Royal Holloway College, University of London, before coming to the Polytechnic of the South Bank in 1989. He studied for his doctorate while working as a CERC research assistant on computer simulations for applications in room acoustics. He was a Royal Society Exchange student with, with the Soviet Academy of Sciences studying in Moscow in 1990 and 1991, and anyone that looks up those dates will recognise what, what interesting years they were to be in Russia. He then wrote two successful um, EPSA grant applications with Professor Bridget Shield, who's here this evening. Uh, the first of those was um, working with the University of, of, of Salford, and the second with the University of Southampton. In 2000, he became an LSBU research lecturer and then became a full lecturer in 2002. 
He was a course director for the um, master's program in environmental and architectural acoustics um, for, for 17 years, I think. I think you started in, two th in, two, in 2003 and you held that up to 2019. So a real commitment to that master's program. During this time, he worked closely with the leading professional bodies. So firstly, with the, with the Institute of Acoustics, cul culminating in being awarded the Tyndall Medal in 2014. And at the same time, the um, Acoustical Society of America awarded him the, the Schultz Grant and the Student Mentoring Award. Between 2007 and 2009, he wrote and led three knowledge transfer partnerships, followed by an EPSERC case award and another KTP in 2012. And this led to him being promoted to reader in acoustics. He accelerated the number of PhD students in acoustics through industry co-funded scholarships, resulting in a REF 2014 impact case study and this case study was on a public address system designed for London Underground, which was a collaboration with Marconi Tellant PLC, a necessity after the 7-7 bombings. In 2019, he was awarded a Higher Education Academy National Teaching Fellowship, and that led him to be promoted to Professor in Acoustics. This is when he um, led the REF 2021 submission for the School of Built Environment and Architecture, the first time the school had submitted, and this resulted in the highest LSBU score. Um, and the key reason for that were two REF impact case studies, one that he wrote and the other that he co-wrote. In 2021, he co-wrote an EPSERC Network Plus grant a um, UK acoustics network, and in 2022 was the principal investigator on an Innovate UK grant to develop a paediatric audiometer with Audio 3 and St. Thomas's Hospital. These will keep him busy until 2026. He currently chairs the Ministry of Housing, Leveling Up and Communities Building Regulations Review for approved document E. He also chairs the Institute for Acoustics Research Coordination Committee and the IOA Musical Acoustics Group. And turning towards today's talk, he's worked with world-leading conservatoires, cathedrals and orchestras, culminating with advising the Royal Opera House on the design of their rehearsal rooms and the refurbishment of their orchestra pit. He says, he says... His love of music comes from his time in the 1990s as a nightclub dancer <laughs> in Dukes and Tots. In his own words, he is the original Essex boy. <laughs> After winning 18 major grants over 30 years, he is most proud, most proud of his work with Foster and Partners on the design of Apple's new headquarters and his work with Anne Kyra Quinn, which ended up in the movie Prometheus. He says neither were funded by the, by the UK government. Recently, he produced two YouTube videos with the social media inf um, influencer Calex on acoustics. This resulted in 18 million views and 20 million TikTok, sorry, 50 million TikTok views. I'll say that again, 18 million YouTube views and 50 million TikTok views. So this led to a, a, a request from, K, from the KPMG Leadership Programme for him to give two experiential lectures on, an, on acoustics to the CFOs, COOs and CTOs of FTSE 100 companies. Stephen says... It would be much easier to understand ac acoustics if it was called the study of oral communication. It is most fundamental to the human condition, as communication is everything we are, everything we could be, and everything we should be. 
Unfortunately, scientists call it the scientific study of sound and vibration. Maybe not the best decision. So Professor Stephen Dance will now try and, and, pers and, pers and persuade us of the importance of acoustics. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I'm hoping I'm in shot. Uh, I'm going to try and do this in 45 minutes, but it might take an hour because I decided you needed some demos. <laughs> demos bring things to life. So the first thing I have to say is I wouldn't be at here without the PhD students. Why? They are at the front of the slides. They are front and centre. Uh, they're not all the PhD students. They're the ones that focused on musicians and architecture uh, specifically. So let's see if we can go through this. That was a beep. That was another beep. That one. There. But we're going to start with some history when I was young. Uh, as a research assistant coming here, uh, fresh from university, straight out of university, and straight into uh, uh, Moscow as an exchange student. So that's, it's a grainy image, in case you're wondering. The film in Moscow was not the highest quality. And then on to working with Salford University in 93, and then Southampton in 96 as a postdoc. And then I became an, LS, an, SB, an S, I have to give the right names. You're going to see why in a minute. SBU. Uh, research lecturer, and then I became a full lecturer in engineering in 2002. But you can look at it from the other point of view and see what happened. So when I joined, we were called the Polytechnic of the South Bank, and I joined the Institute of Environmental Engineering, which then became South Bank University with that logo, and in the Department of Mechanical Engineering Design, which then in 2000, became London South Bank University, they changed the logo again, and it was the School of Engineering. And then it became London South Bank University, the Faculty of Engineering, Science and Technology. And lastly, in 2014, oops, 2014, it became the School of the Built Environment and Architecture. So you can see there's quite a journey of, they keep changing the nameplates. <laughs> It's the same people giving lectures to the same students. When I joined, what we taught was energy engineering. A very simple thing to understand, energy. People understand that. Now it's, then they changed it to building services engineering. I think energy engineering might be a better name. I think people are more concerned about that now. Uh, so I, as uh, Deborah said, I studied computer science. I've used applied mathematics to the... Uh, the issues around uh, acoustics, particularly room acoustics, uh, to create ray tracing. That is what ray tracing looks like. So when you see Avatar, <laughs> that's what we were working on in 1990. And now it's photorealistic. That is what it looked like in 1990 um, to do because computer science has got a lot more efficient. But I'm going to spend like six, seven, six or seven slides on all the other things I do that are not associated with musicians. <laughs> because you don't realise the breadth of acoustics uh, and the issues brought up by acoustics. It's fundamentally uh, communication. So we've got electroacoustics, room acoustics, environmental acoustics, musical acoustics, acoustic materials, and teaching of acoustics. So this is what we did for Ref 14 with London Underground and Marconi after the 7-7 bombings when they couldn't evacuate the deep underground, moved into speech transmission, and then it moved into indices, which moved into classroom acoustics. But the work ended up in uh, Mecca and Medina. That's Medina. That's uh, Riyadh's underground. Uh, they've just put it in. And hopefully, that's Mecca. So you need a public address system to evacuate and that's the largest public, public address system ever built. And it's for about three million people. And so that's where the research on London Underground ended up 10 years later. Uh, but nothing to do with musicians. Uh, 
In terms of room acoustics, we looked at open plan schools. We looked at the effect of the voice of classrooms. And now, with Alec just walked in the room, we're looking at tall creaking in tall buildings. That's the, uh, the Steinway. So there's a bit of music there. The Steinway building in Manhattan, in midtown Manhattan, is extremely narrow. So it's 24 times taller than it is wide, i.e. land prices in Manhattan are extremely expensive. But unfortunately, the people who live there, who are extremely rich, don't like living there because it wakes them up in the middle of the night with the creaking. So that's called having an expensive a rich client. This is the best kind of client. If you can work with these clients, this is what I tend to do. <laughs> work with the people with money. Uh, and then we've got 3D printing of uh, models. So that's open plan schools, uh, the, the, the voice of the teacher, and us trying to work out what electroacoustics can do. Uh, this has become extremely important in higher education as we move now into hybrid teaching. So that means you don't have to turn up to class. Uh, useful if you're in China and you don't have to come to England to study, you get the same experience, but you can ask a question from the audience, you can hear the questions from the audience. And I think that's what they put in this room. The, these four panels above you are microphone white arrays. Uh, we did that work in 2014. I didn't know until I, uh, until I walked into this room you've installed it. Uh, and there we go. And that's, this is Bridget, the, uh, the building bulletin. 93, which is how to design classrooms, doesn't apply to higher education rooms. It only applies to schools. And then we move on to music, but not the music we're going to talk about today, other, other types of music. So the effect of acoustics on singers' voices, the, 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 the problem we have with uh, SITS Pro rehearsals, that was at the, the Royal Opera House. Uh, there's a, a massive iron curtain, literally an iron curtain, but unfortunately there's only two metres left of the stage, and therefore you're very close to the orchestra. <laughs> when you should be five metres back, because that's where mid-stage is. Uh, so we're trying to deal with that. We're looking at the opera singers and how they use their voices. And uh, with St Paul's Cathedral, we're looking at the sound exposure of the choristers. Luckily, they only do 32 weeks a year because they're school children. That's useful. Uh, and that's the choral rehearsal room at the Royal Opera House. Where we're uh, trying to adapt it to improve the acoustic for the professional singers. And then we move on to environmental acoustics. This is urban wind turbines. We started this in 2007 because we knew Elephant was going to knock down its buildings. They are now all knocked down. And we put wind turbines on them to see how they performed. Uh, not particularly well, uh, but Strata went ahead and built the, what, I, uh, what I call the shaver. And uh, you get planning permission for demonstrating uh, a renewable energy. Uh, so they got planning permission and then turned off the wind turbines. Uh, not because they annoyed the people. It was the maintenance cost of running a mechanical system. It was a prototype system designed in Norway, and it had, a, well, a many, many cutout issues because they didn't want any safety concerns. So it kept cutting out and stopping, and then they'd have to come from Norway to restart it. So a terrible design. Uh, then we did the quiet the London heliport. Hang on, here's London heliport. Let's start doing London heliport. There you go. That's where uh, the government decided in the 1950s that the vertical gateway to London should be in Battersea because there was nothing in Battersea, because they moved the docks out to the east of London. Uh, and there was nothing there. Ideal place for a heliport. And then the local council, let's call them Wandsworth, decided to give planning consent to bigger and bigger buildings nearer and nearer the heliport. And thus, people were very annoyed by a heliport. Uh, so not the smartest thing they could have done. Uh, under lockdown, we came up with this, uh, which is the quiet project. So we measured the noise across the whole of the UK uh, because everyone was on furlough, all the acousticians were on furlough, and we got a measurement that included rural people, suburban people, and urban people, so we can see how they live. And what we determined from that, it's impossible to meet the WHO guidance because if it's not quiet under lockdown, when is it going to be quiet? 
The WHL are based in uh, Switzerland, and they have very strict noise compliance in Switzerland. So they think everyone lives in Switzerland. <laughs> they don't have a, what is it like in London, uh, hat on. And then finally, we, uh, Fosters, we, we started a catapult for listening to London for the s local schools so they could have some acoustic kit, which was useful. We're going to find out in a minute. Uh, so that the children could do acoustic measurements. And that was useful for teaching because it, that uh, project created a lab in a box. This is a lab in a box. What we did under COVID is teach, but not face-to-face because -face, nobody taught face-to-face. -face. So we made some films and we made some kit and then sent it to all our students. And we have a new definition of a keen student. If it's 9 a.m. on Teams in London, it's 2 a.m. in Teams in California. They attended a 2 o'clock lecture. 2 a.m. And then they flew in in February, staying in the Heathrow Hilton, because they wanted to come to our lab. So that shows you the, my new definition of what keen student is. This is very important you understand. There are keen students. They do exist. <laughs> And then we had the experiential lecturing, um, which Deborah mentioned, on, oh, that one. on uh, that's, that's measuring in um, uh, Sarah's uh, kitchen. That's acoustics in the kitchen. It's got a fan, it runs at different speeds, so different background noise. It's got a duvet I put on the floor. She was less happy about that. But it, it's damp, I couldn't put it on the ceiling, you see, so you damp the floor. But it, it demonstrated how you can improve speech intelligibility by adding absorption a duvet in this case. You can only use what you've got <laughs> in those situations. So there's our uh, learning, teaching and learning outcomes using acoustics. And then we've got acoustic materials. So this is feathers. This is the Dyson, Imperial's Dyson School of Engineering have to come to us because we're the only one with a lab. So we tested their materials for, uh, for them. Uh, this is the movie Prometheus. The panels behind Sherry Spluron is the panels we designed. They're three-dimensional. In acoustics, things are quite simple, really. The more surface area, the more you can absorb. So if you make it three-dimensional, you've got a bigger surface area. Uh, they thought that it looked futuristic. It went to the New York Design Show. That's where the set designers saw it. And then we've got Apple's uh, new HQ in Corpatino. Uh, that was with Foster's. And that's where, in acoustics, you either see it so it's obvious or you don't see it at all. So this is, we flattered them with a giant banner of apple, <laughs> which nobody can complain about. The fact it was a, it's a Swiss material, but it absorbs sound because everything in their uh, HQ is hard surfaces. So it's terribly acoustically. So it's the only thing we could come up with to solve the issue of uh, communication, making communication easier. So, now we're on to the actual presentation. Let me just check. Half an hour, maybe. Uh, so it's 15 years with the Royal Academy of Music, uh, funding three PhD students. Uh, RAM, as was the Royal Opera House, as were the London Philharmonic Orchestra, all caught out by new regulations driven by Europe on noise. Uh, now, the problem with that is music isn't noise. <laughs> That's the key issue. It should have been called the sound exposure regulations. Much better name. One word makes all the difference to a lawyer. Uh, unfortunately, they called it the noise regulation. And the reason for that is in 68 to 71, when they did the test, they were only interested in noise. So mining, oil rigs, factories, not entertainment. So they had no clue about entertainment. And uh, the Royal Opera House came on board in 2017 uh, because they lost a high court ruling about acoustic shock. Acoustic shock is very simple to explain. It's what you do when you're annoyed with a cold caller in a call center. If you just bang the receiver, an electrical pulse will go down the cable and really damage their hearing. Nothing to do with music. <laughs> Literally nothing to do with music. Uh, but they still won the case. That's, that's called having a good lawyer. Always good to have a good lawyer. Uh, and they're the two buildings I've spent the last decade in. Uh, so, two parts. Part one, music exposure. 
So I'm going to have to teach you something. But before I'm going to teach you something, I'm going to do a quick demonstration. So this is how good your hearing is. Now, how good your hearing is, let me take the lights off. Thank you. How good your hearing is depends how old you are. That is the fundamental thing you need to know about how good your hearing is. So I'm hoping everyone can hear that. It's quite annoying. Yeah? This is 10 kilohertz. This is in the middle. So you, you 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz is in the middle. Now this is going to go up to 12 kilohertz. Can you still hear it? Now you're not going to hear it because this is 16 kilohertz. You have to be young. This is how you define young. That's 16 kilohertz. You're going. <laughs> it's like magic. It's like, oh shit, I'm not young. <laughs> and if you were young or a musician, musicians tend to have very good hearing, that's 20 kilohertz. Can anyone hear that? I'm looking at, this, I'm looking at the crowd and going, you have to be a teenager. No, no teenagers in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, it's normal. It happens to us all. Uh, and I'm now going to explain why, because it's important you understand this, because it's, did I mention it's happening to, to us all? Yeah? <laughs> right, so we've got part one and part two. So part one is really, really audiology, and part two is acoustics. So there's a balance of these two things. So these are the regulations we're meant to observe, they are very reasonable regulations for noise. Uh, so 85 is the number you have to remember. And the other thing you have to remember, and this is the awkward thing, I have to now explain what a decibel is. And it's extremely difficult to explain what a decibel is. So I'm going to use something you're more familiar with, which is the Richter scale for earthquakes. Okay, so very simple. Richter scale goes from 1 to 10. Yeah? A 5 rattles your teacup. A 6 will take down a garden wall or take a slate off the roof. A 7 will destroy your house. An 8 will destroy your city. And a 9 will destroy a region. And there's never been a 10. That's the good news. A decer, meaning 10, means you add a 0 to the end. So instead of 5, you have 50. So 50 is like a, a quiet room. 60s like me talking uh, to person to person. 70s like talking to a group like I'm doing now. And so you can see where 85 is. So 85 is like a busy bar. Yeah, that's what they're expecting. But it's over an eight hour day. So it's a lot of averaging. Yeah. And then I'm going to put, so I'm going to use my pointer. Look, this is eight hours. And then you're allowed over 40 hours as well. But this number is the important one. And it hides a multitude of sins, this decibel. Because 88, which is a bit more than 85, as you probably think, a bit more, is actually twice, twice the energy. Yeah, that's why it's an exponential system. So that's why you can hide quite a lot of things in a decibel. So that is what a normal uh, long hair cells in a cochlea look like. And that is what they look like after they've been damaged. After they've been damaged, they are gone. You're not getting them back. They are gone. Yeah. So it's a permanent effect. This is a rifleman. So thing, thing to remember. One, don't shoot a rifle. Don't be anywhere near a tank or a cannon. In case you're wondering where am I ever going to be near a tank or a cannon, it's the airbag in your car. It explodes in your face. You're not dead. Good but you are temporarily deafened by the airbag because it exploded in your face. In case you're wondering where, where this might happen. Don't worry, musicians have done more stupid things. Water skiing, don't take up water skiing. You crash at water at 30 miles an hour, you're hitting concrete, it goes in your ear, it destroys your eardrum. So water skiing is off, no water skiing, that's clear. No thinking you're uh, Mr. Daly and diving off the side of a yacht in the Aegean Sea, slightly drunk. <laughs> That also doesn't work. These are the excuses musicians have come up with. Yeah? So things can go wrong, is what we're saying. But if you just are careful, it will be fine. So these are the levels, remember, 85 in an orchestra. So you can see 
the violins and the violas, 80, 82, they never complain. They never usually complain. In an orchestra, not in an orchestra pit, in an orchestra. Orchestra pit, much less space. Then you've got uh, the woodwind, that was around 85, and then funnily enough, you've got the trumpets and uh, the contrabass, which is the timpani, and various types of brass instruments a bit over. So the old regulation was 90, which is the reason they didn't come to me in 1990, because the old regulation was 90, the new regulation is 85, and it's trapped, it's trapped in this gap, yeah? So that's why the musicians came to me in the first place. So with the Royal Academy, what we did, because we've got a lot of tame students, they do exactly what you ask them to do in the first three weeks. That's when you've got a student, the first three weeks of a course. After that, they've got a mind of their own. Before that, they do exactly what you tell them. It's brilliant. So I get them in the first three weeks, and they do what I say, because they're 18 and know no better. So they do what I say, and we test. These are uh, trombonists. And we have to put this industrial, this is an industrial sound uh, dosimeter, dose badge in this case, and we measured their exposure. This is going to be important in a minute. Uh, and then we worked out that that is not an appropriate thing to wear on stage. So with uh, MIT, uh, a friend from MIT, Brad, we came up with that. We basically took the innards of smartphones there's a billion of them produced a year. That means they're very cheap. And re-engineered it with a better microphone as a sound level meter, and it's $250. Everything in acoustics is two and a half thousand to five thousand dollars. So that is a great uh, benefit to us because it's very small, which means people are prepared to wear it. And um, we've just started the Innovate UK project with the with the uh, pediatric audio audiometry. This is the interesting thing. So this is when I get rid of the decibel and replace it with a percentage. This is the interesting thing. So that is what you're allowed. <laughs> They're over here, yeah? <laughs> and what's over here? The trumpet. Well, we're not sure. And then the trumpet. And the, the soprano's third, yeah, the soprano's quite loud. This is over a course of a day at the uh, academy, what they typically do in a day. Uh, so you can see the, the pianists are pretty good, and the, 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 the baritone, the singer, the baritone singer is quite good, uh, but the brass are the one, the, the normal suspects, that's what I'm gonna call them, the normal suspects. The problem is, we're allowed 100%, if you stretch it a bit, 167%. They're at 1626 hundred percent. It's not close. It's not, uh, can we get away with it? It is, they should all be deaf. <laughs> they do this every day. They do it when they're not being paid to do it. They do it as a hobby. They do it as a vocation. They don't stop doing it. They just keep doing it. They're obsessive people because they're perfectionists. So I said, well, if we've got this, they should all be deaf. According to all the government standards, and so we go. To, we went to test them. So this is George. We tested where George started, then Ben, then Doug, then Eric. So because it took 15 years to do, because you need thousands of people to test to prove something medically. Yeah. So we all get an audiogram, and we ask them lots of questions, and then. This is what the government think. They should all be, in the, because they're all 18, 18 to 25, all them young. So they should all be there with their hearing loss. And that is not what we found. So that is this green line here. So 95% of them easily exceed this, because they're down. Left ear, left ear is blue, right ear is red. So you end up with these people down here who actually outscore the machine. The most sensitive machine we can make, their hearing is better than the machine down here. And they're all neg half of them have negative hearing loss. Now, for those familiar with English, that means they have hearing gain. That is what they're suffering from. That means London must be incredibly loud to them. Yeah? 
And then you go, well, why do the musicians are so fussy about their hearing? Because the hearing is individual. Only you know what you hear. Yeah? So, and they complain the hearing's not as good as it used to be. Well, nothing as good as it used to be. That's life. <laughs> but yeah, they used to be, I call these, the ones with hearing gain, angels. Half of them are angels. Their hearing is off the scale. And then, as you get older, as you get to 40s, 50s, that I tell them their hearing is an 18-year-old. And that makes everyone very happy when I tell them they're an 18-year-old. Because flattery does work. But according to the government, that's what their hearing is. So they have fantastic hearing. So well done, musicians. So what I did is I collected the data from the retest students. So they do a three and three-quarter year course. And we test them in the first three weeks, and we test them in the last three weeks of their course, just after they've sat their exam, so they're not under stress. And these are, so more strings, as you'd expect, woodwind, brass, piano, jazz, vocal. And then, this is how, when they're asked some questions, how long have you studied? You can see the piano is about five years ahead of everything else. The pianists are starting when they're two. They're literally, they can, they can sit on a stool, and they start to play. This is what these people, and they don't stop. They do it six to eight hours a day, every day. They are unbelievably talented. So we should look after them, unbelievably talented. So this, I put them into groups and got the average dose for the groups, for these 229 people. And then I put them on this chart, because I like this chart. So this is number one. It says on the bottom, improvement. So if you get, as you get more sound exposure, your hearing should get worse. That was it. I just said they have thousands of percent of exposure, not hundreds, thousands. And it's an improvement. They get better at this test. But how do they get better? Well, the pianists get better the most. And then the strings, and then the brass, and then the woodwind. So... The loud, that's on the left-hand side is, uh, is how loud their exposure is, so how great their exposure is. So you can see there's definitely a line, and you're going, well, hang on, why the woodwind haven't improved as much as the brass? Well, the woodwind sit in front of the brass, yeah? <laughs> so they're the ones exposed to the brass, because they're directly in front. And I thought, right, let's put the jazz on, let's see where they are. There you go. What I'm telling you is, jazz is lovely, but it is... So they have very little improvement in their hearing. <laughs> but they've, had, they've studied for three and a half years uh, at the academy. And uh, at a level, remember the level is 85. Oh, what happened there? Oh, there we go. Uh, 85. Well, it's not even on this gra graph that 85 is here. <laughs> so they're way over in terms of sound level, sound exposure level, where they should be. So... When we looked at the general population data from the late 60s, early 70s, it looks like this. So this is how you lose your hearing. You lose it at the high frequencies, 4 kilohertz, there it is. And as you do more and more years of whatever it is, something, mining, batteries, oil rigs, your hearing gets worse. Unless you protect it. So that's the key thing. You can protect your hearing. And there's the 4K dip. And this is what we found with the musicians. So these are the, the guys. So you can see here it's a 6K dip, here <coughs> and here. So, not a full, so music is having a different physiological response in your ear to noise. Yeah? It's still damaging it, not very much. If you look at the numbers, it's a couple of dB. Oh, sorry, a couple of dB, it's not very much. And then the gals. Very distinct loss. I've done it by age group. Uh, there's not many under 16s. They tend to be, for some reason, Scottish, the 17-year-olds. Uh, the, uh, the vast majority are 18 to 24, and you have this distinct dip caused by their instrument. And then I thought, well, let's divide it up into different types of instrument. So this is the singers, musical theatre and vocalists, and you can see a very distinct dip, and you can see... So this goes down to like 10, so a 10 loss, and this goes down to a 6. That's because they're boys and they're girls. Boys have worse hearing than girls, and that is uh, due to genetics. 
So girls fundamentally have a better hearing system than boys, even from newborn baby, uh, which is when we test uh, uh, the children. So you can see this very distinct dip. So we've established music has a different physiological effect than noise on your hearing. And then, this is in case you want to look at brass, because some of you might be brass. Composers, they tend to be pianists. Uh, woodwind. So you can see this. It's very, very consistent. This dip, there's the strings. But well, we're going to get to the interesting bit in a minute. Uh, so my main problem is ethics. I cannot, ex I cannot experiment on people. Uh, but there's nothing in ethics that says they can't experiment on themselves. So... You're going, what kind of experiment could you do that you experiment on yourselves? And I'm going to explain. There is one instrument. And here it is. The pianists versus the piano accompanists. So who are also playing the piano. But they're doing it with one change. A singer in their right ear. Because that's the way the, the layout. And what the piano accompanists do is they, the singers usually do an hour tops, usually half an hour. They get exhausted and go away. But then another, accompanist, uh, another vocalist comes in and sings with the accompanist for another half an hour. They're very loud. I did mention they're very loud, didn't I? So this is what happens after one year. So this is the pianists. You can see there's 300 pianists in this case. And you can see the dip at, at 4 kilohertz there. Left and right ear, very similar. And then this is the Piano accompanies the right ear. There you go. That dip there happened in one year of just, they decided they'll try piano accompanies. And it, it has taken out four decibels of hearing in their right ear at six kilohertz. Exactly what I predicted it should do. What does that mean? Because the pianist is just playing the piano. They're focused on playing the piano. They're not focused on the singer. So their brain, it can't predict what the singer's going to do because fo he's focused or she's focused on the, on the piano. So it's something to do with your brain function that you can shut down your, your response to that sound if you're incredibly familiar with that sound. You'll be incredibly familiar if you're playing it. Yeah? So you're not, you're not singing along on your headphones. You're actually doing it. And more importantly, you've done it for 15 years, <laughs> for eight hours a day. So there's a reflex in your ear called the uh, oral reflex, and we think the musicians might have trained that reflex. So it's no longer a reflex. They can shut their hearing down for fractions of seconds when it's loud, but they can't do it if they're not focused, which is when the opera singer's singing, the opera singer, their hearing's fine because they're focusing on opera singing. So they can shut their hearing down so they can protect themselves. Because otherwise, why aren't these people deaf with thousands of percent of sound dose? So they have enormous sound dose. So what we know from this is all these studies were done a very long time ago when our equipment was very simple. Uh, we, can, we know music is complicated. Every author paper I've read has said, this is a very complicated problem. Because <laughs> it is. A very, you're trying to decide what is music, what is noise, what is sound, and what is the human response. So we needed thousands of people to do these test to try and establish this and what we've worked out is this bit here oh, done it again. <coughs> use my students of music learn how to listen and then gain audiometry so this audiometric test is a response test and it goes beep 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 that's it and what musicians are really good at doing is hearing patterns so they can get a very high score in audiometry, uh, which is why the half of them are angels. So what we needed is another way of testing them. And then COVID came along. <laughs> so this is what we came up with. So this is how you test newborn babies. What you're testing for newborn babies, uh, it was uh, David Kemp who came up with this at the Ear Institute. Uh, this is optoacoustic emissions. So your ear makes a tiny, tiny amount of sound and it makes a little bit more sound if it's damaged. There you go. That's all you need to know. Newborn babies, you can test it because it's not a response. You can't ask a baby to do something. They're not very good at answering. They're just asleep or crying. There you go. <laughs> Sometimes that's what happens. So what we've done is rather than see have they got a cochlea, we've looked at 
how well the cochlea functions. So this is a brand new result, completely blind test, 500 uh, students, in case you're wondering what COVID is important, the cable was two meters long. I didn't have to put them in a soundproof room. I could use any room, however big, so ventilation, not an issue, and I could be two meters behind them, and thus meet the government guidance on safety. <laughs> so that's why we came up with this. And what you're looking on the left graph is five random people. Why are they completely blind who did the test in July because they finished their undergraduate course and then did the test in September because they became postgraduate students? So that they had to do the test twice. And you can see there's basically five lines. It is 99.6% correlation. It is nearly perfect. Same five people, that's audiometry. You can't tell anything. It's no, it's just a mess. It's a 55% correlation in case, you're, in case you're interested. So this system is safer, more portable, more robust, quicker, and we think it should be the new standard in hearing assessment. Unfortunately, getting the medical uh, profession to move forward in any direction, you need more data. So uh, obviously I'm going to collect more data uh, to, to prove this. So the next, hang on, we're on to part two. We're on part two now, the next bit. How, hang on, how are we doing time? Right, if I can do it in 15 minutes, we're perfect. Right, so this is three ways of helping uh, three different uh, areas of classical music. So we've got the Royal Academy, Henry Wood Hall, and the Royal Opera House. So we start off with the sound absorbing mirrors. So this is the sound absorbing mirror. It came from, remember my time right at the beginning? The Soviet space program. If you wrap a uh, satellite in uh, reflective material, one, it has to be extremely light because you, you're putting it in space and weight matters, but it has to reflect so you can keep the temperature of the satellite even. So we happen to have some of this material lying around. Don't know why. Could never find any more of it. But we made a sound absorbing mirror. And this is the, pro the first one we made. It is a mirror. What does it do? Why is this important, the sound absorbing mirror? Because it absorbs the noise and reflects the music. In case you want to, how does it do that? Noise is low frequency sounds, tend to be low frequency sounds, and the attack of an instrument tends to be high frequency sounds. So it reflects the high frequencies and absorbs the low frequencies. So we can improve the exposure. Remember these people stand in front of a mirror and just play their instrument for hours. That's all they do. So we managed to get three, three decibels off, but let's call it halving because it sounds better. Halving their sound exposure. And that's it at the Royal Academy of Music. We put four in, uh, as tested in the lab. What was funny, in the lab, that was prototype run. I, the musicians really liked it, and the reason is it's heat shrunk material. And I didn't, I didn't cross brace the frame, because it's heat shrunk, it pulls the middle in, so it made you look thinner. <coughs> That's why it was popular, run number one. <laughs> it wasn't done deliberately. I was like, oh, I should have cross braced that. Uh, and that's how you test it in our, in our lab, in our acoustics lab. The, uh, you need 10 square meters, so we made 10 square meters. That's the same material without the silver wrapping, the heat shrunk mylar, it's called, type of material. And that's its performance. The key thing, so the green one is, the, is, is, is basically uh, wall insulation. So you, in every building, you'll find this wall insulation in the northern hemisphere. And the, the red one is the reflection. So uh, of the mirror. So you can see it's not absorbing the sound at high frequency. And therefore the musicians liked it. If you, we tried duvets, because you try the simplest thing first, and it, 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 it kills the sound, and they hated it. And I said, okay, so that's not the solution. Because you always try the simplest thing first. That's the golden rule in life. <laughs> try the simplest thing. What do they respond? And then that tells you what you need to do. Uh, so we've got 2.5 dB reduction for brass, strings, and woodwind players. Now, we move on to Henrywood Hall. So things got interesting. This is with Doug. 
This is a beautiful uh, church converted in the early 70s into a uh, music rehearsal space for London's orchestras. And it's literally five minutes walk from here. It's a lovely square called Trinity Square. Definitely go and visit it. It is a lovely part of Borough. Uh, it looks like that. In the snow, admittedly. And it looks like that on the inside. So it's, it's not for an audience. It's just purely for the orchestra. And what we did is this. We took some air beds. Remember I said take the simplest thing possible? Simplest thing possible is air beds. 30 pounds. They are absorbers. And then we took a thinner air bed to prove that the thinner it is, the different response you'd get. So the different performance. So we've we have to have 10 square meters of air beds, which is four air beds. And then you see that's the, the blue one, this one is thinner, and it just absorbs, this is absorption here, one, at a few frequencies in the, in the lowish range. But the thick air bed is a very effective uh, absorber across the whole of the low frequency range, and it costs 40 pounds. So Arup went off and did a report for them and said it will be about 120,000 pounds to put a load of uh, Helmholtz resonators made of wood, which means you can't pick them up because each one weighs 50 kilos and there's going to be hundreds of them uh, for each individual frequency. And I said, I think I can do it with air beds. So we put the air beds in. Air beds. 30, uh, I calculated they need about 30 air beds. And then that's what it looked like after we sort of hid them around the back <laughs> in the corners. That's where the low frequencies tend to hide, in the corners. And then we did a test. And the difference is this rise here makes the room, the black line, too boomy. And what you want is a flat line, which is the blue line, with the air beds. So they were very happy with the air beds because they're very light. If you don't like them, you just pick them up. They weigh two, two or three kilos. You, they have a plug built in, so if they need inflating, you just plug it in, and then one minute later, it's inflated, and it absorbs the low-frequency sound, which is what they were complaining of. The reason is, these buildings are very churches, very, very thick walls to hold the ceiling up, because they didn't have any structural engineers in the 17-somethings. So you have to have a thick wall to hold the ceiling up, because you have to, there's no pillars, essentially. Uh, and then finally, we come on to the last... <laughs> How are we doing? Pretty good. The last solution, this is the Opera House. Uh, we talked to the Opera House in 2017, and to be honest, I didn't know what the solution was. There were some offers of some solutions, which was take out the first six rows to make your orchestra pit bigger. Uh, so six being shut for six months, it turns out they were shut for much longer than that, but <laughs> we didn't know that in 2017, and uh, reconfigure your auditorium. But we came up with the idea of new materials. So this is, this is the, actually from the, uh, the Royal Academy of Music, and it's the sound of the orchestra as an image. So that's the image. Um, because this problem has been worked on for 100 years. This is not a new problem. Yeah? But what's happened over the 100 years is the auditoriums have kept getting bigger which means you need a more powerful instrument to fill the space. And why would you do that? Accountants. More bums on seats, more money. Therefore, let's make it bigger. That's as simple as that. That is what happened. Did not realising you're, you're deafening the musicians because in an orchestra pit, there is no space. So we had to find a, a, a problem, which is like an insolvable problem. So loudness, why is there so much loudness in the pit? Why has this not been solved? So when there's sound, there's loudness. When you put 100 people in an orchestra pit in a cavity, that amplifies the loudness. So what we came up with was what you want is the sound not to be in the orchestra pit. You want it to be in the auditorium. They're the people paying. So you need to get it from the orchestra pit as fast as possible to the auditorium, and then the audience will enjoy it more. But if you do it faster, you don't ha you, um, you, it doesn't have to be as loud. So that was the, the, the principle. So when, you, when it's louder, uh, you, you hear yourself, the louder you play, 
the less you hear yourself, the louder you play. Uh, the evolution of musical instruments, they've got louder. So there's a lot of loudness in this. So it's a very difficult problem to solve. And this is how we solved it. I'm going to have to be very careful with this. Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, an orchestra pit from above, and it's a simulation. Oop, he says. Oh, maybe I can use a mouse. That'll be easier. There we go. There. Right, so that, this is thanks to Brian, who now works for Apple. That is an orchestra pit. They're the sound waves. They look very similar to ripples on a pond, yeah? But they're very dark. They're very powerful. And this is with some diffusers. Now, diffusers are what you use in a recording studio, yeah? So this, the same 80 milliseconds, I think. So it, it comes out the same, and then it breaks up. So your brain won't hear it as as loud. So it, it's... It's more speckled. That's what we were aiming for. So we think that's possible. Now I'm going to tell you the problem. They have to be about 35 centimetres deep, and we only had 10 centimetres. There's no room. So we had to come up with an entirely new type of acoustic diffuser. But as it happens, there was some science, some recent breakthroughs in science called metamaterials. There we go. And using that, we could cheat. Now, basically, science is cheating. That's, I should point this out. Uh, mathematics is the science of cheating. <laughs> so we've got, how can we get the ensemble, the support, and the feedback to the musician, so it still feels to the musician. That's a room that's too reverberant, so too echoey. That's a room that's too dead. You want something in between. And the thing that makes it are these diffusers. These diffusers, but they're all too big for the space we had. So that's what diffuser looks like. It's a big lump of wood. Uh, it's, it's, it's a clever lump of wood <laughs> because it breaks up the sound. And that's what we were interested in. So we need an unconventional treatment. So these meta materials came about in the mid-teens of the last decade. So very new, and they're usually used for antennae, for electro uh, communication, so ele electromagnetic waves, uh, very, very small. Uh, they, uh, they can have gains, they're usually used in the military, yep. These, this type of metal material. But we thought we can make an acoustic one. So we 3D printed it, and here it is. I will hold it up. So this should be 28 centimeters deep, and it is two centimetres deep, that does exactly the same thing. But it's very slow to 3D print. <laughs> so it's not the material. So unfortunately, they've given it the wrong name. Don't know why. It should be called a, a, a meta structure. It's the structure that does the magic, not the material. It can be made of anything that's hard. So you can, you can bend metal and it would do the same job. But 3D, 3D printing, you can make it exactly what you want. And that's what we needed for the Opera House. So that is the, the first ever test of an acoustic meta diffuser. So that is the original, uh, the meta diffuser, and that is what we were trying to get. So what it does is the sound comes in and it's radiated randomly out. And if it's ra so a mirror, radiates directly the same as what comes back. So you can see yourself, exactly. This, does the, this will be terrible as a mirror, because it just puts the energy in all directions. And because it puts the, all the energy in all directions, it means the energy can escape the orchestra pit. And I'm going to show you how. Here we are. So this is a side view. So this, the top bit. Can you see my? Yeah. That's the overhang of the orchestra pit. Yeah, so you've got the timpani and the brass at the back of the orchestra pit. So this is without. And unfortunately, where the two uh, wave fronts combine is exactly where somebody's ear is. <laughs> you, you, you imagine the timpani, you're sitting down. It's about 2.2 meters. You're sitting down about 1.1 meters where your ear is. It's exactly the wrong place. That would be better if they stood up. That's why I said. <laughs> if they stood up, it would make a difference, because you wouldn't be in the middle. And then this is with the diffusers. 
So you can look at the, how it breaks up very, very quickly. In, in 20 milliseconds, it's completely broken up. So the sound has escaped. And that means it won't be loud because your brain integrates sound over, over a time period. So we can get the sound to escape very, very quickly. And therefore, it will appear loud to the musician, but not in a dangerous way because it's spread over time. Yeah? So we're spreading the energy over time rather than all being hit at once. Yeah? It's like pushing at somebody rather than hitting them in the face. Same amount of force, but the impact time is much, much shorter being hit in the face. So this is where we are with this design. We think it will work. We think it's going to go into the Royal Academy before it goes into the Royal Opera House, one. The Academy's pit is even smaller, and therefore it would be easier to install it. And two, you can do whatever you like with students. The reason is the regulations are for employees. Can you see a flaw in the regulations? <laughs> no. So obviously the, the professional musicians are all employees. The students are not employees. Therefore, they are not covered by the regulation. There's a few things that need to be sorted out with the government. That's all I'm saying. Right, so I would like to thank, to, find, to finish off the Royal Academy, the Royal Opera House, London South Bank, particularly the, the, all the acoustic uh, students who've helped me over the years, the uh, Acoustics Network, and the European uh, Cooperation for Science and Technology. They all helped us. This is what we're aiming for, working together. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. Working together for the benefit of all to create wonder. Thank you for listening. <laughs>